Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In 1959, the CIA secretly kidnapped a Soviet space probe and returned it before anybody noticed. So in 1959, the Soviet Union had been launching their Luna probes towards the moon. The first one that succeeded was Luna 1. It flew past the moon and onwards into deep space. Luna 2 impacted the moon and Luna 3 took the first pictures of the far side of the moon. And it did this using film that had actually been captured from CIA cameras that had crashed in the Soviet Union. Um, but anyway, during that year, there was an exhibition that had been touring various cities. It was a, an exhibition supposed to show the, you know, the importance, the power, the quality of Soviet culture that had machinery, had fashion, music, and it also included a model of the Sputnik and a full-size lunar probe, which in the West had been christened Lunik, as in Lunar Sputnik. And it was a full-size upper stage for the lunar rocket. The lunar rocket was the same basic R7 booster that was used to launch the Sputnik with an added third stage propelled by an RD-0105. This was an engine that was derived from the Vernier engines that steered the first stage of the R7, but it was optimized for vacuum use and you know it ran the standard kerosene and liquid oxygen propellant of the rest of the engines. And the stage that was placed on display wasn't a mock-up, it wasn't a model, it was an authentic piece of hardware. It lacked an engine, it had had a lot of the electronics removed before it was put on display. It, the fairing had a window in the side, there was something that looked like a space probe inside it. While the exhibition was in Paris, the CIA apparently were able to get about 24 hours access to photograph and do other non-destructive tests, and they were able to get some measurements on it. And they decided that this was the real deal and that they should put some effort into getting access to it elsewhere. So this exhibition moved to a number of other places, but they couldn't get access because of a 24-hour guard provided by you know, Soviet handlers. Instead, an opportunity to grab it while in transit presented itself while the exhibition was in Mexico City. Uh, this exhibition ran from middle of November to December 15th, which means that it's pretty much exactly 60 years ago that CIA agents and their assistants were able to arrange for the crate with the Luna stage to be the last one to leave the museum en route to the train yard. This truck would be escorted by two cars with a CIA agents to make sure that they weren't being followed by any other agents. They knew that at the train yard there was a Soviet handler who had limited information and didn't know the exact number of crates and didn't really have contact number. He was just there to make sure that crates got on the train. So as things were looking okay, they looked like they weren't being followed, the truck took a wrong turn just before the train station and then the driver was swapped out and the original driver spent the night uh, with CIA handlers in a hotel. They took the truck, covered it with a tarp and then they took it to a salvage yard which with a high fence that they had basically rented for the night specifically for this task. Then they waited. About half an hour later, the Soviet guy at the train yard went home, having thought that he had all the crates in his, in his hand, waited a little bit longer, and then they figured the coast was clear, so they began work. Now, they had flown in some agents that were specialists in this hardware, so they began to take this thing apart. The first thing they had to do was get into the crate. The crate was not a small thing. It was like six meters long, four meters high they would take the planks off the top and then the people dropped in inside the crate with the hardware. Inside the crate, they worked hard and they worked fast. They would measure everything, photograph everything, and they began to take it apart. They took out the window to the fairing and climbed inside it very carefully, having made a point of taking their shoes off so that they wouldn't leave marks. Um, at the back, they had to take off the plate that protected the engine compartment, and that required removing 130 bolts, which were apparently metric bolts. The CIA report notes this, so they had to have metric hardware for taking everything out. Um, there were also parts that were protected by seals, plastic seals with wires, so that if they were tampered with or, or removed, they would break. 
But of course, what they did was they asked the local uh, CIA agents, can you fix this? Can you do you forge this? And they were like, oh yeah, we can totally replicate that. So they took the sections out, sent the plastic seals off to the local forger or whatever to be duplicated that night. Now, this allowed them to get inside everything. They could see that the while there was no engine, there were the mounting brackets, there were the propellant tanks, they were able to swab the tanks and uh, figure out what kind of fuel it ran on. They were able to measure the tanks and figure out just how much mass was in there. They could pull out the space probe mock-up at the top and underneath that in the you know payload basket, they actually found some electronic hardware which hadn't been removed because it wasn't accessible. So they actually took out some special connectors and sent those off to get analyzed. You know, they, they didn't return them to them. Those were souvenirs that were kept. I wonder where they are today. But yeah, uh, they, they measured this in every single way and then carefully reassembled everything. They put in the forged seals, closed up the case, and by 4 a.m. they were done. And that meant they could t drive the car or drive the truck out of the yard, take it to the... Um, train station, swap the drivers back, and at 7 a.m. the guy that was supposed to be responsible for loading everything onto the train turned up after a good night's sleep and signed in the crate, put it on the train, and off it went, and nobody was the wiser. So that's what happened. What did they learn from this? Well, every single part they photographed, they were looking for manufacturer's markers. And they found clues as to where the hardware was being built. They figured out where the spacecraft was being built. And of course, that meant that they could start trying to narrow down other features. But really, I think what I, I find most interesting is that they, by measuring this, by knowing the propellant, by knowing the size of the propellant tanks, they pretty much figured out that the mass of this thing was 18,000 pounds. So that's, you know, well, figure that out. Like eight tons? Yeah, thereabouts. So they had a, a very good estimate of the mass of this. They had been observing the launches out of Russia and they had seen Luna 2 and Luna 3 headed to the moon. And using radar, they had not only tracked the spacecraft, but they had tracked the boosters after burnout. So using the understanding that the boosters probably accelerated the uh, upper stage as much as possible, they then said, well, that is how fast the R7 can go if it is pushing an 18,000 pound payload. Uh, they figured out that it can push 18,000 pounds about 3,400 miles. And from that, they were able to pretty much verify the performance of the R7 rocket and then extrapolate it for all future missions. So just by measuring the mass of this probe, this or sorry, this upper stage, they were able to then verify that the performance of the R7 was more or less what the Soviet Union had been reporting. What I find really fascinating is right at the end the, of the report, or a report, they talk about how the R7 rocket paired with you know, different kinds of upper stages can have a great long life. It can you know, fulfill all sorts of missions. And of course, the R7 booster is still in use today because that's what's used to launch the Soyuz. Granted, it's been upgraded a bit since then, but you know the CIA were right back in 1959 that the, the R7 has a you know, quite a capable vehicle. So this is a fun story that I've seen a few times in the press, but I also see it over-reported, like that the CIA needed to perform this Mission Impossible style of operation so that the US could catch up with Soviet capabilities. And that's simply not true because none of this stuff ultimately affected the US space program. What it did do was it gave the CIA the information to be able to evaluate the R7 and various other pieces of Soviet hardware. The Luna upper stage would actually, interestingly, ultimately evolve into the upper stage that put Yuri Gagarin in orbit in Vostok. So, again, very similar pieces of hardware, very similar heritage, and the CIA used this information to extrapolate these things going forwards. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.